Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Well, this is a wonderful turnout for uh, Friday night, so if there's more that come tomorrow night, they better get here on time. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have, uh, I've been more and more preaching for the Romanian community uh, recently in Detroit and also in North Carolina and then in January back in Phoenix until I'm just wondering, are there any Romanians left in Romania? Are they all here? Yeah, you brought them all with you. <laughs> I'm supposed to be back in Romania in June, Lord willing. Um, and the, the only unfortunate part is that I have preaching engagements here in the United States as bookends right before and after my one week in Romania. So I'm just flying straight there for a Monday through Friday and then straight back. And it, it just uh, pains me because the more I've been in the Romanian community in the United States, everyone keeps telling me, no, 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 no. You did not go to real Romania. You went to that city. You have to go to my city. You have to go to Bistrița. You have to go to Timișoara. You have to go to Cluj. You have to go to here. You have to go to there. And so I feel like I just uh, I have so many places now that I would like to visit. Again, my name is Robert Martin. Say it with me. Robert Martin. And uh, I am from Orlando, Florida. Would you say that? Orlando, Florida. Why are we saying this? Because after every service, people will come up and say, what is your name? <laughs> it's not really that important. We're here for the name of Jesus, the strong son of God. Amen. But this will just uh, help my life be a little less annoying by everyone asking my name again and again and again. And I am from Orlando, Florida. I'm not Romanian. I'm not related to a Romanian yet that I know of. I, uh, I'm not the grandchild of a Romanian. I'm just really privileged pastor and honored that you would have me, Brother Joseph, that y'all would confer together amongst yourselves and invite me. I know you have great ministers amongst your fellowship, and so I'm so honored to be here. If you have your Bible, let's go to the book of James chapter 1. I will ask you to stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. James chapter 1 and then 2 Samuel chapter 11, but we'll begin in James chapter 1. The Bible said, let no, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Hear me tonight. If you find yourself with a sin problem, God is not a part of that equation. You plus God will never equal sin. God is not in the sinning business. He is not in the business of tripping us. He's not in the business of tricking us. James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, people must have asked, what is the equation of sin? He makes it very clear, God is not tempting anyone. So then how does it happen? James explains here under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but each one, everyone, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own the King James says lust, the New King James here says desires, and is enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now I'm just curious because in the English we only have gender neutral words, but in many languages of the world, including Greek and, and Romanian and Spanish and Portuguese and almost all other languages, I guess, there are masculine words and feminine words. So in the English we say lust and entice, they are de gender neutral words, but in the Greek one is masculine and the other feminine, and it's an obvious relationship between that which which is on the inside and that that opportunity of temptation which is on the outside and and James says when they get together there is a conception so I don't know you would know in the Romanian if there is a, a gender uh, emphasis on the on on lust and enticement of that relationship aspect but it's there in the Greek one more passage in 2nd Samuel chapter 11 2nd Samuel Chapter 11, the Bible said it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. 
And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you, Lord, out of love for your people to make us aware of the distance we have between us and you and specific places in our heart that we can ask God for you to come and wash us in your blood and draw us near, that our hearts would be broken before you, which is the, the only sacrifice you desire tonight. Lord, that we would leave aside ceremonies of tradition and religion and come to you with an open heart to be honest in your presence. Convict us by your word and by your spirit. Get all the glory for what you accomplished this, in this place this week, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated tonight. I didn't do this for the illustration of this sermon, but I, I saw uh, a child in the foyer that I could not resist. He had a big smile. Is it Timothy? Titus. How old is Titus? He's one. I heard he's like the church mascot. Uh, I, 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 he, ju he, just, he was just so perfect. I could not help myself. I just said, Titus, you need to come meet your Uncle Robert. Come here. And he, he's now my favorite uh, member, my favorite not yet baptized member of Passion for Christ. I love the name of this church, Passion for Christ. Somebody asked me at a store today, uh, so I, I didn't have on a mask. I didn't know there was still a mask mandate. We forgot about COVID about two years ago in Florida. And so someone asked me if I would put on a mask. I said, oh, sure, no problem. Is that a store policy or a city or the statewide? And they said, no, I think it's still a state mandate. And that's neither here nor there. And while we were talking, they said, so you're not from here. Where are you from? I said, Florida. And um, I didn't know if that was going to prompt some political frustration. They were nice about me being from Florida. They weren't too prejudiced. And they said, what brought you here? And I said, I'm preaching at a church. And they said, what church? And I, I was just so glad to say, passion for Christ. That's a whole sermon right there in the title of... <laughs> What kind of church do you go to? The kind where we're passionate for Christ. It's everything. I love it. And so, uh, amen. As I, as I came in tonight and I saw Titus, I just, I, I know you might think this is weird. I, I, I just, there's something that is just uh, anti-anxiety medication when you hold a child especially if they're sleeping all is right in the world you're just you just feel a peace come on you somebody's thinking that's weird Robert it's okay it's not you it's me I feel like I'm constantly uh, I'm constantly in the presence of people scrutinizing and and judging and thinking and there's so many things I could be offending but a baby's not offended you're just holding it and it's just it's just happy until they start crying I did not plant a baby in the crowd tonight for a mother to pinch and make it have an illustration. But, but when a baby starts crying, then what's, what do you do? You give it back. I'm done babysitting. The moment of pleasantness was over. Take it. You don't give it to a stranger. You give the baby back to its mother. I, I am fascinated by, uh, by nature, that, the, the animal world. And what, what, what is so interesting to me is how different species, there could be 10,000 emperor penguins, and yet when that little chick squawks, here comes its mother waddling over. Where it knows the cry of its baby. Uh, I, I was in Bolivia several years ago. We saw just not at a zoo, just out in nature, a three-toed sloth came climbing down out of a tree. And I heard that there were some, um, there were some uh, hikers, and they had found a baby sloth out in the jungle on the jungle floor. It's a very unsafe place for a baby sloth. They looked around. They couldn't find its mother. They took it to a safe place 
Rehabilitation Center, and they said, how are we going to find its mother? And this baby's crying. It's making whatever baby sloth noises make. Anybody want to try that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they sound like either. And so they said, this is what we'll do. They recorded the sound of the baby sloth. They went out into the jungle where they found it. They set up a speaker, and they played it until that mother heard the cry of its child and knew that's the cry of my baby. A uh, 100,000 wildebeest and that one baby, and here comes its mother. It's the same all over the world. A father will sleep soundly through the night while the baby is crying. A mother is up tending to a child, but let some intruder rattle a window or a door. Here comes father ready to put some Glock ammunition in whoever's trying to get in the house, and the mother might just sleep right through. We are tuned to different sounds and the sound of a mother uh, oh, the connection between the mother and the cry of her child is so unique she knows that's my baby what are you saying Robert I'm saying that James makes it clear he said that when that which is on the outside connects with a desire a lust on the inside when it comes together there is sin that is conceived and when it is conceived, it may be small, but hear me tonight, it never stays small. That's why the writer of Song of Solomon said, beware the small foxes, don't come in and spoil the vine. Why? Because we put up fences against the wolves. We put up big fences against big sins. Nobody in here is tempted with murder. I hope not. Nobody in here is tempted tonight to think I can't wait to get out of service and get high on meth, to, 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 to OD on heroin. That's not what's in your mind. You have no temptation of such thing. You have a fence against those big wolves. But little foxes look like puppy dogs. And we make allowances for little things and say, oh, but Robert, everybody's got their little puppy dog sin. It's no different than what she has, no different than what he, he does that on his phone. She gossips that way with her friends. They, even their parents are have a little bit, even church leaders do this. And so if everybody's got a puppy, then why are you picking on mine? Because the Bible says once it's conceived, it grows. My dad told me about somebody that he knew when he was growing up, we my family lived on the uh, outskirts of a, of a national forest area in Florida, and um, we lived on 64 acres over my back fence with thousands of acres of forestry. And unfortunately, when people want to get rid of pets, sometimes they just take them in the woods and drop them off. Somebody say, aw, that's sad, isn't it? They just abandon them out there? So I wasn't really, I wasn't really familiar with pet stores. All I knew is that pets come up to your house. My dad had one rule, if they don't bite the children, they can stay. But we didn't go get pet food, we just fed them leftover human food. If they were hungry, they could go out in the woods and find something else to eat. And so that was my normal thought. You, you have stray animals that come up, and if they get along with your family, then they can stay. And so my dad said when he was a boy, he had a cousin and, uh, that had a German shepherd. And he said that German shepherd was always out in the yard as an outside dog. He said, and one day a stray little black cat comes up in the yard, and he thinks, oh no, my German shepherd is going to attack attack this little kitten and he said but they started getting along and they started playing and so he put out some milk and the, the, the kitten stayed and he kept feeding the little black cat and it, it began to grow and he, they, they became best friends and he said one day he looked out the window and he said the black cat was now bigger than the German shepherd and he realized this was not a stray cat this was a panther this was something wild this was something abnormal and what can happen in any every one of our lives is we make allowances for something cute and small. We, we, we make allowances for, for children to say, oh, isn't that cute? They don't know any better. And we do the same thing for ourselves. But James said, when lust and enticement get together, there's conception. And when it has come the full term, when it's had its final trimester, it gives birth to death. And when you give birth to something, it's your baby. Others don't hear the cry of what you're struggling with tonight because it's not their child. 
Like someone going through a store, someone sitting on a plane, someone distracted with a multitude of things in life that have no children or are not familiar with your children. If it's not their baby, they can tune it out. But if it's yours, you know that cry. God comes to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it. See, there's voices happening. There's the voice of God calling out to Cain to worship. I'm not much a TV, uh, um, I'm not much of a t-shirt maker, but if I was to make one, I think I would put on the front, I'm tempted. But on the back, I would say to pray, to witness, to give, to serve. Because we only put the temptation in a negative context as if the only voice that any young person can ever struggle with is the voice of the enemy to do bad, to be rebellious, to have a bad attitude, to be self-centered, to do all, to be lazy. What about the voice of God? Is there not a speaking God in heaven? Is there not a voice of the Holy Spirit? Is there not a conscience? Is there not the goodness of God that draws men to repentance? Is there not a leading Holy Spirit that will lead us in paths of righteousness for his namesake? So so then why do we only feel that the temptation, the draw, and the desire is on the side of the negative? Abel heard the voice of God drawing him to worship with sacrifice, and he obeyed that voice. He was tempted to give God a sacrifice of praise, and he obeyed that temptation. I pray you get tempted this weekend to encounter God in this altar, in worship, in obedience after leaving these services. I pray you get tempted to share what God is doing in your life on social media with your friends when you go back to school that you're tempted to give your testimony to a lost person that you're tempted to increase your prayer life I can tell you don't like the way I'm using that word but hear me the devil's not the only one that has a voice of drawing it depends which voice you're listening to and God says to Cain sin is crouching at the door it's desirous for you the opportunity is there and hear me friend the opportunity will always be there if you pray and fast 40 days and don't put one cracker in your mouth this the opportunity is still there at the door which is one more reason why heaven will be wonderful not just because there's no more cancer and no more war and no more starvation and no more funerals and no more heartbreak friend there'll be no more temptation and no more sin only holy 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 forever and ever I don't know about you but I'm pretty excited about that no more carnal nature no more flesh no more drawing and pulling us into the worst version of ourselves, but only Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so Cain, God says, the opportunity is there at the door. Anybody here have dogs? Anybody have a dog? Anybody have a dog? Anybody have an inside dog? Well, y'all live in the Pacific Northwest. I'm sure y'all have to keep them inside. Where I come from, a lot of people have outside dogs. If you have an inside dog, do you ever let it out? Please tell me you let it out sometimes. I have a friend in Orlando who had a, a little toy, small thing, dog of some sort, and she was scared that an eagle or an owl or something would snatch it up out of the yard so she wouldn't let it outside. There was little puppy pads all over the house for the puppy to do. I, you shouldn't talk about those things in the pulpit. But, but... But the dog was never allowed out, so just do me a favor. If you have an inside dog, let it out. If it's taken away by an eagle, go get a bigger dog. But you know, you know if somebody has an inside dog that they let out as soon as you walk up to their door. Why? There's scratch marks at the door. Always. Because if that dog's ever been inside and knows what it's like to be invited in, it will never be satisfied staying outside for too long. And it will scratch and scratch and scratch at that door until you let it back in. And God says to Cain, sin is crouching at the door. But thank God, God says to us through Paul, there is a way of escape. Hear me, you don't have to open the door. 
John says in 1 John, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is all of sin in these three categories. A paraphrase says it like this. That is wanting things for yourself, wanting your own way, and wanting to be seen as important. So you don't have to be a drug dealer, an axe murderer, or some person that you put in a category much worse than you and say, well, thank God I'm not as bad as them. John makes it clear, wanting things for yourself, wanting your own way, and wanting to be seen as important are the categories that Jesus had to die for on the cross. And they're sitting at the door, crouching, scratching, waiting. And, and God says, if you let it in, it's now your responsibility. If you let it in, its mastery will be over you. It, it, you will have to govern it. You will have to rule it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That thing that you let in and you say, I'm strong enough to maintain. I, I'm, I'm, I'm churched enough now that I know how to keep this under control. That you have to have mastery over it. But all the while, that thing that you've birthed is crying. Even now, while the word of God is going forth, some of you cannot even tune in to what God is saying to you because in the background of your career, of your heart in that baby bed of your own soul there's something crying out for your attention and your neighbor doesn't hear it nobody else knows it but you have given birth you gave in I gave in and because of that there it is crying even now wanting your attention why do you preach so loud Robert why do you have to scream because I'm not competing through, through with anything in this room I'm competing with the spirit what the Old Testament calls a familiar spirit Spirit. I'm not saying you're oppressed or possessed. I don't believe any born-again person can be demon-possessed. But I do believe that temptation knows where to come knocking. And the devil's not going to come knocking to me with sin that has no effect on me. But if he finds what you're tempted with, what I'm tempted with, he's familiar. He comes with that assignment. He knows where you're weak and where to trip you up. And that voice, that cry, that thing, vying for your attention is in competition with the voice of God. So sometimes I'm willing to lift my voice a little bit louder and say, hear the word of the Lord over every other voice competing for his truth in your life. You'll find that voice of temptation becomes so much louder when you are idle, when you are living without purpose, when you have no goals, when you have no direction, when you are lazy, when you are alone. And David, when kings went out to war, found himself feeling so important and yet with nothing to do, alone an idol. Hear me, young person. If you're going to work for God, if you're going to serve God, it is the will of God for you to be diligent in the harvest field of the Lord. Find something to put your hand to. I know the Bible says on the seventh day you shall rest, but you forgot the rest of the commandment which says six days ye shall work. Oh man, I wasn't going to get an amen from a teenager on that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Put down the video game controller. Put down the social media. Close the magazine. Stop looking for the next hangout and find somewhere to serve in the kingdom of God. And you might just find that like Ruth and Boaz, while they were serving in the field, they met the will of God for each other. Hallelujah. You're not going to find the will of God playing a video game. Well, that was free. You didn't even pay for that one. Hey, but you might find the will of God when you're serving at a soup kitchen, when you're serving in the church ministry, when you're serving in your hands are diligent but David was idle and he began to hear the scratch at the door he found an opportunity and when that which is inside met with that opportunity he didn't have to say yes but when he gave into temptation the Bible said she conceived if you know the story well and I'm sure you do he thought he could cover it up brought in her husband from the battlefield said now go home for the evening he didn't he slept at the door of the palace why didn't you go home he said why should my brothers in arms that are in battle have no comfort at home and yet I would be able to enjoy it and so David sends him back into battle with a scroll holding his own death certificate that Joab the general was to put Uriah on the front lines withdraw from him allowed him to be killed and then Joab sent back to David and said Uriah was killed in battle of course he was David forced the hand he forced it to be happened. Now he's an adulterer and a murderer, all to cover up the secret. 
No doubt word began to spread. There's a lady living close to the palace. Her husband's dead and she's with child. But Israel doesn't want a scandal. The people of God don't want to have to, they don't want to have to deal with this, so just cover it up. David invites Bathsheba into the house. And that baby is born. And every time it cries, he knows that's the sound of something, some sin in my life I gave birth to. Every time it cries, he knows I did that. That's the consequences of what I've done. And then Nathan the prophet comes into the, the chamber and he, he comes into the court. He comes into the palace and he, he gives an illustrated sermon. He gives a, a parable of some situation. Then he says, this, this is really what you've done, David. Thou art the man. You did this. And David repents. That baby dies as the consequence of what David did. There is grace and mercy. God can turn it all around. The next child that's born by Bathsheba is Solomon, and it wasn't any of the other legitimate spouses and wives and children that gave birth to the next king. It was Solomon. Oh, the goodness of God, that he could take your broken situation. He could take the person, the person you become out of the consequences of sin, and after true repentance, use you anyways. See, preaching on sin should never become an excuse for you no longer to obey God in the future. It should never become your reason to cancel your purpose and your calling that God still has for your life. But first, you have to deal with the voice of that which is crying out for you. Cain slew Abel, and now God says, I hear a voice. If the worship team wants to come. God says, now I hear a voice. Abel heard the voice of God calling for worship. And like the psalmist who said, when you said, seek your face, my heart said, your face I will seek. Do you hear that voice tonight? Not from a worship leader. Do you hear the drawing voice of God that says, seek my face and have you responded? Have you been tempted to lift up a hand? Have you been tempted to lift up the great name of the Lord? Have you been tempted with that or have you been tempted to be self-centered and say, I don't feel comfortable doing that. So I'm going to do what I want to do. That's the lust of the flesh. I can't wait to get out of this service and get what I want to get. That's the lust of the eyes. I hope I know somebody that gives me attention. And I, and I, I hope I'm popular in this room. I hope, I hope she sees me. I hope he sees me. And that's the pride of life. You're going to hear a voice. You're going to respond to one or the other. And when Cain let in that thing that was crouching at the door, it ruled over him. It was his. He became angry with his brother. He slew him. And now God hears a voice. He says, the blood of Abel is crying out from the ground. Think about that. Have you thought about what Jesus is talking about when he prays three times in the garden of Gethsemane? Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup of the wrath of God spoken of in, in Revelation and in the prophets of the Old Testament. The cup of wrath that's poured out on the nations because the multitude of sin. Hear me, Jesus did not just come to die for you, he came to die as you. Because the consequence of that death was on me and was on you. Why? Because heaven heard the cry of our sin. We gave birth to it. Could you imagine if there was a room full of crying babies in here? You wouldn't be able to hear me preach. It would be maddening. It would be overwhelming if you heard the voices of, of a multitude of infants and toddlers screaming. And in the, in the ears of a holy judge, the father heard nothing but blood crying out, sin crying out. Think about it, every adultery, every molestation, every child abuse, every domestic violence, every broken home, every, every injustice, every, every hatred, every racism, every, every prideful, arrogant, every word, everything that's against him, it cries out. God said, how do I deal with this cry? This cry that you gave birth to. This cry that I gave birth to. Years ago, Moody Bible Institute put out science videos, not even videos, VHS. I was preaching in Colorado Springs, and 
this, uh, this boy was, uh, uh, the pastor's grandson was homeschooled, and he loved these old VHS videos about science. And so I went to the pastor's son's house, and the grandson said, Brother Robert, would you come watch one with me? And so we're watching this old video. Check this out. This is fascinating to me. You know how long it takes the light of the sun to get to earth? Seven minutes, right? Like something like seven minutes. If you're looking at the sun, you don't see what the sun is radiating. At the speed of light, it takes seven minutes from what it leaves the sun to get to you. That means if you're on the sun and you had a magnificent telescope and you were looking at earth, you would not see what's happening right now because what you see is as a result of refracting light, you would see what happened seven minutes ago. Now think about standing on a star that may take years, years for light to travel from that star to us. One star in that video, he says, if you're standing on that star and you were to look through a telescope, you would not see now. You would see Joan of Arc mounting her forces 700 years ago because it takes 700 years for the light of that star to reach earth. You know what that means? It means that no wonder what David said in Psalm 51. He said, my sin is ever before me. But you know what he was also saying? My sin is ever before you. The omnipresent God is here, but he's also on the moon and on Mars and any, everywhere in between. Meaning everything that we've done, like a ripple effect going throughout the universe, is brushing up against the holiness of God. You know what it's like to be offended and then relive that in your memory? And it's a trauma because you go over it again and again. But the things that we've done against God, our maker and our creator, that everything else in creation obeys him. He tells the mountains to rise and they stand. To the valleys fall and they obey. To the river to run and it obeys. To the birds to migrate and they do. For the porpoises to swim and they do. And he tells man and woman, come. And we say, no, I want to do what I want to do. And it's a slap in the face of a holy God. Maybe you didn't get high today. Maybe you've not done something that you've put in a category as horrible. But if you'll listen to the witness of the Holy Spirit, he'll deal with your heart and say, you want to come closer to the Lord? Deal with this. That is an offense to his holiness. How do we deal with it? The cries of all of our sin in that same science video, they said sound never is never deleted, it's never erased. Sound waves become so small that the human ear can no longer hear the frequency, but it hasn't disappeared. You can't hear radio waves that are in this room, but they're there. And everything we've ever said is a continuing sound wave that goes out through the universe. Everything you've ever done and everything you've ever said, and beyond that, everything from your heart, it's going against God. But when you bring it under the blood, when you bring it into sincere repentance, no wonder God says, I will cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? All the way around the globe? Oh, no, friend. The blood covers it from here to the sun, to the moon, to the stars. The blood covers everything that I've ever done from here to the very throne room of God. It's no longer in his face. It's no longer an abomination before his throne. It's no longer a sound that's assaulting his holiness. The blood covers it all. The earth was full of the cry of that which you and I gave birth to. But in one moment, Jesus, he said it is finished in his language one word to tell us die in one word <laughs> Woo, glory to God maybe you're not tired of your sin yet maybe you're not tired of that thing that's have a hold on you maybe you're not tired of the thing crying for you oh but if you've ever just wanted it to be silent so you could hear the voice of God how you would rejoice to hear Jesus say it's done it's finished the voice has no more power over you you don't have to respond to that cry tonight 
I preached at a youth camp in North Florida several years ago. A girl came to me in that camp. She said, I've never been to church, but my friend, she goes to church. She invited me to come with her to camp, and I got saved on the first night. I said, praise God, wonderful. That's awesome. On the last night, she got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. I was so happy for her. God changed her life. Then she messaged me a week later. And she said, what should I do? The friend that brought me to camp is now asking me to go to a party with her. And I said, but you know that the stuff that happens there is what I got rid of at camp. And the girl that asked her to come to camp said, you know these guys will be there and they like you and they like me, so don't make a big deal of it. You can be forgiven. Let's just go and have a good time. You know what was different between the church girl that invited her to camp and the girl that was not used to church at all but was freshly surrendered to Christ? That girl that had been in church for years knew how to respond to a voice in this room and then respond to the cry of that other thing when she walked out the door. Of course, we don't believe in abortion in this natural, but in the spiritual, James says something is conceived. And if you let it take full grown status, it's coming to destroy you. You can create a cycle where you say, I'll hear his voice here. But when I walk out that door, there's something else crying for my attention. Why don't you deal with it tonight? What a loving, good God that would give you his voice again and say, bring it to me. And we can say in this altar, it is finished. Stand with me to your feet all over the house, if you would, please. In 2007, there was a man in the outskirts of Denver, Colorado, who went into a YWAM missions compound on a Sunday morning, opened fire, and killed several people. He somehow got away without being captured and drove down to Colorado Springs an hour south where he showed up in the parking lot and then the foyer of New Life Church in Colorado Springs, massive church there. He came to do as much harm as possible. But they had a safety team in that church, a security team, God bless America, where people come to church packing, <laughs> praise the Lord. I don't know if that's legal in Washington, but it's legal in Florida. You see people kneeling down at the altar and you see their sidearm all imprinted on their Jackie Eli. Somebody's protecting us. And there was a former police officer, female police officer, that was invited to be on the safety team. She had been to all the meetings. She took it very seriously. And that week she had been fasting and praying. And the Lord said, come to church prepared. She felt like there was... There was imminent danger and she needed to be on guard, but the Lord had prepared her for that moment. She had her sidearm. She was ready. She's watching. And when that man that had just shot and killed several people at a missions compound in Denver pulled up in the parking lot and pulled out his firearm and began to shoot to do as much damage, indiscriminate of women, children, pastors, whoever, tried to take out as many as possible. This security officer, this former police officer, she pulled out her gun, she fired, and she took him down. I remember seeing it on the screens in the, in the airport. I remember seeing it on, on newspapers. No one said this woman was evil or a murderer. Of course not. They praised her. They said, what a hero that when others were running in fear, she ran towards the danger and she took him out before he could take anybody else out. Now, thank God there's nobody who's walked through that door tonight brazing some AK-47, nobody with some kind of semi-automatic weapon, waving it in the air, trying to take out you and your wife and your husband and your children, nobody who's come to be a terrorist in the natural. But hear me, Job 1 said that when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord, that Satan arose in their midst. And if you think the Holy Ghost is the only spirit that shows up at church, you have no discernment at all. There is an enemy of your soul. And Jesus said, do not fear the one who can only destroy the body, 
A terrorist could pull out a weapon and take out your body, but there is one who seeks to destroy your soul, your eternity. Friend, it is only right and just and holy for you to take him out before he takes you out. You're in the crosshairs tonight. And if there's something crying, if there's something crying that only you can hear, your conscience is grieved. Some of you even had to whisper to your friends and be distracted by your phone, even in this service, just to get away from the discomfort of that thing crying for your attention while the voice of God is saying, won't you give it up? You know why we call this an altar? We don't just call it the blessing place because the only way to get blessing is to bring something to an altar and an altar is a place of death. When we come tonight to seek the Lord, we're bringing that thing that we birthed. I can't kill it on my own, but I identify with Christ. That's the gospel. He died for me. He died as me. Now I can be free from this thing that's trying to kill me. If there's a terrorist for your soul, he's familiar with what's tempting to you. And if you don't take out that thing tonight, its plan is to take you out. But there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Would you for a moment bow your heads and close your eyes all over this room? Please, no one coming or going, just for a moment, reverence the presence of God. I'm going to invite you in a moment to respond, and I'm going to ask that whether your friend does or not, your spouse, your children, your girlfriend or boyfriend, would you tune all of that out in you, you before the presence of the Lord? You and Jesus. He stands with nail-pierced hands. The cry of everything in your life that is an offense to his holiness can be dealt with now. James said, when lust and enticement have come together, they conceive and it's growing and it's crying for you. If you let it in, it's crying for you. David, no doubt, had heard the cries of things that, that triggered his memory to his disobedience. Oh, but there's a blood that will wash you tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Be, be ever so sensitive to the voice of God and tune out every other voice in this moment. If you're here and you'd say, Robert, I realize now my sin is no better or no worse than anybody else's. I cannot stand here and defend myself and say that I am right on my own. I have something in my heart. I'm familiar with it. It's the same thing that's drawing me away again and again. And like Pastor said, I don't want to repent small in a comfortable place. I want God to take it all. I want Him to wash me. I want Him to take it out before it takes me out. If that's you, without a moment's hesitation, you're here tonight and you say, I have something in my heart that I need to get right with God. If that's you, stretch up a hand right now. Stretch it up. Brother Robert, pray for me. We need to get sit, We need to get this right with God. We need to get this right with God. We need to get this right with God. Friend, if you have your hand up, will you not delay even one more moment, but will you step out of your seat and come kneel in this altar? Come quickly. Come now. Come on. Do not delay. Hands lifted all over this room. Oh, there's blood for you tonight. There's forgiveness. More than forgiveness, he'll make you new. Don't just stay in the aisle. Come all the way to the front, please. They're coming behind you. Come all the way to the very edge of the platform. Come on, make way in the aisle so there's room for them to come in behind you. God bless you. God bless you. Lord, we come to your altar. We come to your altar. Oh, thank you for Psalm 51. Thank you for anointing David to give us the psalm of repentance for his sin with Bathsheba. Thank you, Lord, for showing us through your scripture how we could cry out, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew within me a right spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence, oh Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Some of you, it's been so long since you've had joy, you've had happiness, you've had comedy, oh but the joy of salvation has been distant, bring your heart bring your life under the blood tonight oh he'll silence the cries he'll silence that which is crying out against him hallelujah, would you pray all over this altar some of you lifted your hand or maybe you didn't but you need to be calling out to the Lord tonight, there's still room in this altar come, even if you're a leader, even if you're a church uh, elder whoever you are, there's room, there's 
there's room for you to come. Come with your spouse. Come with your children. If you're a small child, you feel the Lord drawing you. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. There's room. Come and talk to God. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. Wash me. Wash me. Come on, do business with God, young men. Do business with God. Just you and the Lord. It's you and the Lord. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As far as the east is from the west, he erases it all. Oh, thank God. You can have a clean conscience before you leave tonight. You can be cleansed in your heart and cleansed in your mind. Don't repent small. Repent big. Take it all. Take it all, God. Take it all, God. Take it all, God. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. It's crying out against me, Lord. It's crying out against me, Lord. Wash me, wash me, wash me. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't want to hear it anymore, God. I don't want to hear it when I get home. I don't want to hear it, God. I want to hear the voice of the Lord. I want to hear the voice of the Lord. Hallelujah.